I'm Dean Bruce Maggot. I'm Dean of the Brandeis International Business School. And my job is a very simple job. It's uh, really just to introduce the moderator. Uh, but before I do that, by, by a show of hands, uh, who has participated already in the, uh, any one of the Lewis uh, the Brandeis Centennial Series uh, lectures? Everybody. Well, then, Dan, I, very, I really don't have to say very much about it at all. You know what we're celebrating. Uh, but but, but I'm, let me just say it again, because I think it's important. Obviously, we have a series of events. We're very proud of the name of, uh, uh, basically, that the university is named after. And, and if, we, if we just think back in terms of uh, the events we've had so far and, and what we're talking about and uh, connecting the community. And we had a discussion at lunch. And we were saying it's really interesting if you look at the works of, of Justice Brandeis and what he wrote about. Uh, and including comments on business and society, um, his writings preceded social media, preceded the era of computers, but they're so pertinent, they're so insightful that they, they pass the, uh, the passage of time and it's so exciting. And, and the, you know, the other thing I would say is if we reflect back at that time, one might say when President Woodrow Wilson, I see some historians in the room, but uh, a gentler uh, time, but when President Woodrow Wilson nominated uh, Louis Brandeis, uh, first of all, an example of diversity, right? The first Jewish American to be nominated for the nation's highest court. And, and by the way, with everything that we're reading about in the paper today and seeing on TV, um, nobody, nobody said to President uh, uh, Woodrow Wilson, hey, this is your last term. You really should not be nominating somebody to the Supreme Court. So. Uh, with that, I'm going to leave it, and um, we're going to get to the heart of the program. I'm going to introduce my colleague, uh, uh, Professor Breen, um, and just a little bit of background about him. How, well, how many of you know who he is because you take his class? All right. Oh, I love it. I try to do that in my school as well. I always try to get some students there. But, but uh, maybe you don't know about him, but the, the few people, let me just tell you a little bit bragging about him. Uh, and I don't have my reading glasses on, so I had to, but um, after receiving his law degree at the University of Georgia, he received a PhD in American history at Boston College. Uh, and if I can pronounce this properly, his doctoral dissertation explored pragmatic jurisprudence of Henry Friendly, a longtime judge on the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, and perhaps the greatest Louis Brandeis law clerk of all time. And so he began his duties as a full-time instructor in the Legal Studies program in 2015. And as would be appropriate for somebody teaching at Brandeis, he teaches courses such as Louis Brandeis, Law, Business, and Politics, among other courses. So we're very lucky to have him as a moderator, and he will introduce the panel, and we look forward. And I should just tell you in advance, be prepared to have questions, because if you don't, Dan has given me a list of about 10 questions for me to ask. We'd much rather have the audience than my canned questions. All right, with that, let's start the program. Dan? Thanks very much, and it is my happy duty to introduce our panelists this afternoon for our privacy panel. I'll begin with a man sitting to my left right here. This is Stephen Mermina from the class of 89 here at Brandeis. He teaches space law at the Georgetown Law Center, and he works at NASA in the Office of General Counsel. He has written about space law at many different uh, attributes of the topic, but his latest article is Astronauts Redefined, the Commercial Carriage of Humans to Space and the Changing Concepts of Astronauts under U.S. and International Law at the FIU uh, Law Review. He has also participated in drafting and negotiating 500 separate international agreements regarding space, aeronautics, and science. And then uh, to his left, uh, in the middle of our panel, is Professor Anita Allen, who is the Henry R. Silverman Professor of Law and Professor of Philosophy at the University of Pennsylvania Law School. She uh, was appointed by President Obama to the Presidential Commission for the Study of Bioethical uh, Issues in 2010, and she has published extensively in uh, articles and books on the topic of privacy. Uh, her books include Unpopular Privacy, What We Must Hide in 2011, and The New Ethics, A Guided Tour of the 20th First Century Moral Landscape from 2004, and she is also the author of what is perhaps the leading uh, textbook on privacy law in the field, Privacy Law in Society, with uh, Professor Mark Rotenberg. And then uh, to her left, we have our third panelist, Shane Harris, who is the Senior Intelligence and National Security Correspondent for the Daily Beast. He is also the Arizona State University Future of War Fellow at the New America Foundation. He has uh, written two books, uh, as well as many, many uh, different other kinds of writing on topics of national security and privacy. 
uh, but his books include Watchers, The Rise of the America's Surveillance State, uh, and also from 2014, uh, At War, The Rise of the Military Internet Complex. And finally, our commentator, uh, sitting here at the end, our own Marion Smiley from Brandeis University, and she is the uh, J.P. Morgan Chase, Professor of Ethics in the Department of Philosophy here at Brandeis, the author of several books and many articles on a whole host of topics in regard to ethics, politics, and philosophy, including uh, uh, free will and determinism, pragmatism, democratic theory, and the practice of rights. She is currently at work on two book-length pro projects entitled Dependence, Autonomy, and the Welfare State, and Democracy and Paternalism. So what I propose to do is begin our session this afternoon with just a few general questions to our panelists that will allow them to elucidate some of the topics they bring up in their papers. It is true that Louis Brandeis did not write terribly extensively on privacy, but the two works that he did give us on privacy are the two founding works of what became American privacy law. The first one, the uh, famous article with Samuel Warren in the Harvard Law Review on privacy, and the second, of course, is famous and still very influential dissent in the case of Olmsted versus the United States. And uh, in keeping with the great tradition of privacy law building on Brandeis's writing, all three of our panelists have written their own expostulations on what Brandeis means to them in their essays. And I'd like to get things started by asking uh, Steve, here directly to my left, to talk about his concept of translation, which he discusses in his essay. Uh, how is it that a series of doctrines held by the Founding Fathers could find translation, as you put it, in the Olmsted descent translated again, perhaps in much the same way, to a long host of decisions in recent years involving things like cell phones and GPS. Uh, how does translation understand how the founder's concerns can be relevant today? Thank you. Um, first, I have to say it's really, it's a personal honor for me to be here. I'm looking at the students in the audience and I can say, honestly, I literally was sitting in your seats. <laughs> between 1985 and 1989. And um, I had Professor Whitfield and uh, for American Studies. It's good to see you again, it's been some time. You haven't changed. <laughs> um, and Professor Touster and Joyce Antler and Jacob Cohen and David Worcester and a whole bunch of folks in the American Studies program. So it's really a pleasure to be back. Um, to talk about translation, uh, I, I, I think the entire panel is really interested in how could Justice Brandeis's ideas from 1890 still have applicability today? And it's almost um, in jest, you can ask, what did the founding fathers think of some modern technology? What did they think of the internet? How, who could answer that question, right? What did they think of GPS? What did they think of satellites? There's really no way to say what could they think of these technological developments that didn't exist at the time. But what we can do is take their sentiments, take their feelings about protecting the person, protecting the sanctity of somebody's thoughts, protecting the, the privacy of one's home, protecting what's whispered in the closet, and keeping that away from government intrusion. So if we take their ideas that they wrote about in the 1890s, 1920s, 1960s, up through 2012 today, some of the recent Supreme Court cases on privacy, we can take their thoughts and apply them to modern day circumstances irrespective of today's technology. Okay, thank you. And maybe on that note, it'd be good to turn to Shane for a moment. Uh, your paper has to do with the uh, NSA debates and you make a provocative statement in your essay. I'd like you to defend it or explain what you mean by it. Uh, the statement goes like this. Brandeis wasn't just ready for the debate on the NSA, he leads it. Yeah, I, I was, it's, it's, um, as a journalist writing about these topics for the better part of the past 15 years, and by topics I mean surveillance, the war on terror, counterterrorism, uh, very much the world that Edward Snowden sort of came along and illuminated through a bunch of documents, but that many of us as, as journalists have been writing about for a long time, um, the, the phrase right to privacy gets thrown around all of the time. And I doubt that most people who I talk to on a daily basis, or even most of us, really kind of understand what the pedigree of that is. And when I was going back and looking at the essay uh, the right to privacy essay more in depth and then the Olmsted decision, what struck me, well a number of things struck me, one of which maybe we'll talk about later is the extent to which Brandeis seemed just remarkably hostile to journalists uh, and people who do what I do for a living, which is sticking my nose where it doesn't belong. Uh, and sort of how that gave right to this idea of 
privacy that you might be violating. But what I found is remarkably prescient, and just to echo some of Steve's comments, is this is somebody who is sort of not just trying to sort of imagine what the technology might be that could invade this realm of privacy, but who fundamentally understands that technology evolves and that it is going to look different a generation from now than what it looks like now, but there is this sort of sanctified kind of zone that we have to carve out. Um, but particularly what, what made me make the comment about uh, um, uh, sort of leading the debate against what might become the NSA or an intrusive government surveillance state, because of course the NSA was not around uh, at, at the time of the Olmsted decision, was this idea that Brian, uh, uh, Brandis is writing about that you know, crime is contagious and that we can't just allow the government to act as lawbreakers and that the court has to, I think, as he said, resolutely put its face towards sort of de de defending against that. And here was somebody who was em embracing these ideas of, these new novel ideas of privacy, juxtaposing them to the sort of invasive nature of this technology that was proliferating in society. At the time, it was cameras, instant cameras, and then quick developing cameras wielded by journalists. Um, but I think it seems to me somebody who is laying the fundamentals down for what that debate would actually become. Uh, and it just was really struck me that even though he could not have contemplated the internet, perhaps, and what it might look like, he could certainly and was very uh, aware of the possibility of technology that would in evolve in such a way that a government or a state or uh, a journalistic organization could you know, take your papers without ever having to get inside your house. And that's exactly what the National Security Agency and associated intelligence agencies do. That is what they were set up to do, was to take information without people knowing it. And I was just uh, deeply impressed that he was able to kind of hold these uh, values and his imagination all at once together and, and lay out a set of arguments that we are very much using uh, today. He, he sort of saw the landscape without having even been there, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, they used this uh, phrase, sanctified zone, an area free of intrusion that ought to be ours and, and ours alone. And one wonders if uh, that zone exists in any meaningful way these days. And on that note, I'd like to turn to Anita and uh, ask you to talk about the case that you highlight in your essay, the uh, Svensson case. And for those of you uh, who don't know, that's a case about a photographer who, as an artistic project, decided that he was going to use a telephoto lens and day after day take pictures of people inside a building that was characterized by some pretty large glass windows. Uh, he was sued for invasion of privacy by uh, at least one of the couples there, I think the Foster family, and uh, the judge ruled against the Foster family in their case on the grounds that there was an artistic temperament at work here and there was an artistic sensibility. Now, I wonder uh, if you can use that case, which you highlight so well in your essay, to talk about uh, how that case might be criticized and what was at stake in that case that maybe the judge missed. Yeah, so uh, in every part of our lives these days, we're challenged to find privacy, when you walk down the street, there's the cameras everywhere, uh, there's monitors inside of classroom buildings and, and uh, public buildings. Uh, we know that our telephones are, are and our Skyping is in theory accessible to the government. So where can you go in the world and enjoy privacy? Well, the, the number one candidate, I think, at least conceptually, is, well, you go home. You go to the privacy of your own home, you close the door, and in that space, you are left alone to do what you will, and nobody can observe you, criticize you, or monitor you. But what the case that was just described uh, proves to us is that our, uh, our, the value we placed on the home, the notion that the home is a person's castle has steeply eroded to such an extent now that even when someone takes a telephoto lens and trains it on your living room window, your bedroom window, and takes photographs of you day after day, and then mounts those photographs in an art exhibit and puts you and your children on display, even when they do that, you can't say, my privacy has been invaded. Because what the court said, this is a New York uh, uh, state court, uh, both the lower court and the appeal court agreed, completely agreed, every judge agreed, that art takes precedence over privacy. So just because the intent of the uh, intrusion, the peeping Tomism, was art, the First Amendment comes into play, and so what ordinary people believe is their right of privacy, in fact, is not. Great. Thank you. And now we'll turn things over to Professor Smiley for uh, your comment. I loved all three papers, um, and I love them in particular because I think they do something smart that a lot of other work on the subject matter of privacy and technology does not do, and that is construe privacy itself 
as part of context, construe privacy not as an absolute ideal or um, something to be fetishized, but rather one thing amongst many others that we need to value in society. My comments have to be brief. In the next five minutes, I'd like to just bundle them in the following three ways. Uh, all of which point to what I genuinely uh, find to be extremely good about all three papers, even though they're very different in terms of their foci. The first uh, set of comments will point to um, the sheer fact that privacy here is understood not as an end in itself, but rather as a mean to other ends that we might pursue in society. That might seem obvious to people in law, but people in philosophy, and I think sometimes in everyday life, assume that privacy is a primary good, which leads them, of course, to miss why we value privacy. We're valuing it for further ends, I'd suggest. Uh, the second bundle of comments suggests um, that we need to argue about privacy in a contextualized way as part of different sets of practice and to do so by virtue of pointing to those very ends for which privacy is taken to be of value, whether it's autonomy, self-control, non-domination. We need to set up a normative debate that goes something like this. How in particular contexts um, should we balance privacy with other values that we put forward? How more, moreover can we test whether or not privacy is going to protect things like self-control, empowerment? How can we test whether or not certain kinds of privacy rights are going to um, hold to what we value here? And is a right to privacy necessary? We need to talk about rights more than we do. The third set of points that I wanted to make um, has to do with the fact that I'm old. And let me back up a little bit. I sometimes go to privacy and technology conferences or conferences on the philosophy of privacy, and I get really gung-ho about the importance of privacy to protecting the self, especially in light of Facebook and surveillance and all these kinds of technological developments. And inevitably, a much younger audience <laughs> turns back at me and says, you know, that's sort of an old-fashioned conception of the self you've got going there. <laughs> you really got to understand nowadays, we don't worry so much about privacy because we have a different conception of ourselves as part of a world in which we are constantly being viewed. So my second set of, third set of, and second and third together sets of comments are going to just probe the importance of this possibility of an evolving self, which requires us to rethink privacy in a technological world. So, very briefly here, um, let me just point out, and this is the professor teacher coming out of me, and I feel terrible, but as someone who spends most of her time grading, <laughs> let me just say why I just thought these papers were so much better than the other stuff I have to read in the field. <laughs> that's, the only, that's the only paradigm I have here. <laughs> and begin by saying that unlike those who treat privacy as an absolute value, all three of these papers underscore what I think is a value in association with privacy in a liberal democratic community. And let's remember, privacy is something that liberal Democrats value probably more than others. That's not always remembered. Ends that include human dignity, control over oneself, the ability to experiment with one's personal identity in private so that one can become a person that one is not now and probably the kind of person that one will only become if one is not constantly being judged. So the freedom from being judged here, which we often forget about. And of course, there's the security and the feeling of safety that one has when one's privacy is protected that is only possible if one doesn't have to constantly look over one's shoulder. So the sheer fact that one can shield oneself in such a way that one is not fearful and then finally, I would add <clears throat> something that Professor, um, well, that Anita is, is famous for making clear here, <clears throat> and that is privacy is not only about individual autonomy. It's also about the preservation of relationships, 
and also about the ability here of individuals to fight off domination. So it's not just here about what I can do. It's the kind of society that I want in which certain forces, whether it's the state or the press or one's family or one's friends on Facebook, can have a domineering effect over one. So these are the ends of privacy that come out of all three papers. They're ends that are important to remember. The second thing, now that I'm grading, that these papers do so well is to point out that the right to private uh, life, the right to pr uh, privacy here, along with the nature of privacy itself, is not absolute with respect to content. It's constantly in flux. And since that content is so constantly in flux, we have to also recognize that our right to privacy is constantly changing throughout time. And in particular here, what we see in all three papers is the cognizance that the right to privacy has to be balanced with other values in society. Again, philosophers, maybe not legal scholars, start out with a value, talk about it constantly, and don't acknowledge that it's shaped by the other values around it. And in all three papers, we see these competing values or principles being juxtaposed with privacy, uh, starting with artistic achievement. I loved your paper. That wasn't art, I'm sorry. <laughs> that was just an invasion of privacy. Uh, news of all kinds, whether it's news that's important to democratic voting or, uh, as Shane points out, news that's just really good hardcore gossip. These are the kinds of ends and principles in these cases, I would argue, that illegitimately lead us to balance away our right to privacy. There's winning divorce settlement. There's selling products. All of these are put forward as principles to balance privacy. I'd argue that all of them are not particularly legitimate, but then we do come across legitimate principles, like those of crime prevention and national security. In any case, once we map privacy out and view the right to privacy as shaped and continually reshaped by principles, arguments in society, as well as technological developments, we can come up with an argument about where we should place boundaries around our private sphere. That's a contextual argument. Um, I could come down where I'd fall in these kinds of normative arguments. Do we really need to to, uh, to shut down the internet in order to get, gain a sense of dignity? Uh, do we really need to sacrifice our dignity when we allow drones to take pictures of our marijuana crops? Uh, are we really forced to conform to social norms uh, in the so, uh, social and sexual realms when uh, our private affairs are being made public? The answer is probably yes, but the point is, that in each of these cases we ask the question, given the ends behind privacy, is privacy as a right something that we should be ascribing? Does allowing the press or the state to give one's estranged spouse uh, photographs, collect data on us, does that really help so social sexual relations in society? And always with the thought in mind that we need to think about power and domination. In each of these cases, what are we doing for individuals? but what might we also be doing against society in terms of setting up domineering forces? So, as a moral philosopher, I'd participate in that normative argument, but what I want to ask people who are legally trained here is whether you think the flexibility uh, of that kind of argument, the fluidity of the positions that would come out of that kind of debate is sustainable in law. Because it might be the case that if we go contextual here, have a normative debate about privacy, it's gonna be so particularized that we can't actually sustain a right to privacy in law. And that's where philosophy and law might uh, come up heads to head against each other. Second, for particular, uh, particularly a uh, uh, question I'd like to ask uh, Professor uh, Allen here is whether or not you think the messiness of this right to privacy that surrounds the person because our person goes out in the world and can be so controlled by surveillance, whether or not that supposedly progressive model of Brandeis <laughs> that supplanted the home metaphor uh, can do anything more than it already has for us. You suggest we need to go back to the home paradigm of privacy, or at least take the home or the spatial metaphor of privacy seriously. I'd like to, to, 
to ask you more about that in terms of whether you, don't, you think that's now progressive, whereas it once was something to be replaced. And then uh, in terms of questions that arose for me at least, um, I'm very interested here in the possibility that we ourselves should be responsible for creating privacy for ourselves. All three papers hinted at different places that we should think legally, politically about the boundaries of privacy, but then each of you actually mentioned in different ways that maybe every human being should take responsibility for making sure that they have privacy. I'd like to know where that individual perspective comes into play as well as the structural ones. So that's the normative debate that I think we should have. I do worry that the law isn't flexible enough to sustain it. I'm also wondering here whether or not individual responsibility might take the place of some laws, but also here whether or not this model of the home, the spatial model, might be something that we come back to. Let me end my comments with this query of an old woman. <laughs> And as someone who has been shocked over and over again about audience responses to what is sometimes taken to be a fetish with privacy. So I was particularly, these are just responses that um, I know are important, but I'm not sure exactly why they're important. <laughs> but I know they're important, so I'm going to specify at least one set of them. And that comes out of a conference I attended in Helsinki about four or five years ago, a conference where <clears throat> that basically involved four or five of us over 50 years old giving profound papers on privacy in a changing technological world, decrying technology, decrying the violation of privacy, spewing forth analytic um, principles that really did reflect a certain frustration with technology in a world where privacy is being violated. Interestingly enough, the response from the audience, and these were largely younger people most of, of whom were from Scandinavia, maybe that's the point, mm -hmm. uh, was that, you know, you don't seem to have understood. We don't worry so much about the violation of privacy anymore because as I've mentioned before at the outset at least, uh, the self has changed. The self has changed with and perhaps because of technology. We consider ourselves always being watched. We consider ourselves being viewed at most times and we're comfortable with it. We don't have a problem with being viewed. Uh, therefore, we don't have as much of a concern with violations of privacy because we don't have the notion of the self that's assumed all the way back to Brandeis. Brandeis clearly assumed a very tightly bounded self, an autonomous self. Most of those who write on privacy assume something like that. So I'm wondering here whether with technological change, we see evolving conceptions of selfhood a more public self, a self that feels more comfortable being viewed, for whom these worries about privacy are either not as great or perhaps different. Would any of you like to respond directly? Uh, I, I think we all want yeah, to respond here, here <laughs> to our A plus grade you gave this week. <laughs> okay. I only gave you an A. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Go right ahead. But I will now well, give you an A plus. <laughs> let me, let me no do a little gun here. Um, so uh, before the case that was described with uh, the um, Foster family, it was another case in New York, um, and the uh, plaintiff in that lawsuit was a man named uh, Mr. Nusenbeg, who was a Hasidic Jew. One day, Mr. Nusenbeg was walking through um, Times Square in Manhattan, and unbeknownst to him, uh, a artistic photographer, uh, Philippe de, de Corsia, took his photograph. And then a few years later, uh, Mr. Uh, Nusenbeg discovered that uh, his head, a headshot of him, was in an art exhibit, and that the photographs of him and others, the heads, were being sold. So he uh, brought a lawsuit saying, wait a minute, my privacy was invaded. This person took my image, my likeness, and turned it into a commodity for sale in the marketplace. This is offensive to me. It's highly offensive to me as a reasonable person. Uh, I should be compensated. Also, it was too late at that point to enjoin the show. It, was, it had already been up. The things had been sold. Um, so many people said, well, but wait a minute. You're walking down the street in Manhattan, for Christ's sake. You know. <laughs> Not for, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. But you know. Um, so um, my Easter is showing. I'm sorry. Uh, so. so uh, you have no, no right of privacy in Times Square. He uh, 
amended his lawsuit to say, but wait a minute, I am a Hasidic Jew. Uh, there's great religious significance to me in my image. And for someone to, to take my image and turn it into a commodity, it's just, it violates my First, my first Amendment rights. You know, you have the First Amendment claims of the, of the, um, of the, um, of the uh, photograph uh, man and the artist. And of course, the artist's claims are, um, are victorious. But again, people say, well, but he was on, in a public place. That's why when this other case came up, you know, commentators thought, well, this is the perfect case. Because now, the people photographed were inside their own houses. Inside their own houses. Surely there, the photographer cannot violate. And the court said, oh, yes, the photographer can. Why? Because um, art takes precedence. And they did also emphasize that, well, you know, it's a glass, wind, glass house. People in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. As if somehow, if you choose to buy a Tribeca loft, you no longer have an interest in light and fresh air. Because if you open the window or go to the window to get light and fresh air and someone takes your picture, it's gone. Your privacy is gone. So um, I'm not so much interested in, in um, rehabilitating the house or the home as in asking a question, which I love the audience's response to and my fellow panelists as well, if not the home, then where? Or what? Because we're completely at the disposal of others who find us useful. We are utilitarian objects for, the, for artists, for the government, for corporate America. So I, it's not about the home as much as about if not there, then where. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I, I was struck by your comments on <clears throat> the, you know, the fluidity of privacy. And it's something that has really been impressed upon me in covering surveillance after the 9-11 attacks. I mean, what do I mean by that? Um, if, if you were to look at the world of the National Security Agency, the FBI, government agencies that were vested with the authority to monitor people's communications uh, under certain circumstances for counterterrorism, intelligence purposes, what have you, prior to the 9-11 attacks, this is an incredibly restricted highly, highly regulated area, which is not to say that it's not today, but if you were to talk to somebody who grew up at the NSA as an analyst in the 1980s, it was drilled into them <clears throat> that you never, ever, under any circumstances, ab absent extraordinary, unusual circumstances, and with a warrant, do anything involving the private communications of American citizens. Why was that? It was not because there was some sort of idea of a more sanctified, absolutist privacy in the 1980s, it was because in the 1960s and the 70s, the intelligence community was indiscriminately monitoring the communications of war protesters, of civil rights activists, of a Supreme Court justice, of Martin Luther King. Um, this was scandalous when it was revealed in the 1970s, that you literally had the instruments of government being turned on its own people for the purposes of monitoring their political speech which was protected by the First Amendment. In 1972 and 1973 and 74, this series of regulations and new laws are put in place that stop that from happening, that guard against that. So privacy in the national security context becomes this sort of bulwark for keeping the state from going back to the bad old days when it was monitoring people for their, for their uh, political speech. Um, fast forward to 9-11, of course, we know that that all starts to fall away and starts to change, both legally but also sort of contextually and culturally. And I was struck by something uh, when I was working on my first book, The Watchers. There was a, a speech in 2007 by a guy named uh, Donald Kerr, who at the time held the position of Principal Deputy Director for National Intelligence, which means number two spy in the United States, right underneath the Director of National Intelligence. And he gave this extraordinary talk in Washington, which was open to the public, uh, where he sort of started riffing on the nature of privacy and what it means to people in his position in the intelligence community. And mind you, this is somebody who grew up in that world of like there is a bright line that you do not cross uh, when it comes to the private communications of Americans. And he said to this audience, most of which were people from the intelligence community, mind you, you know, the definition of privacy today does not mean to the current generation of young people in their 20s what it meant to us when we were growing up. And the government and the intelligence community are well aware of that. They completely got that this whole definition of privacy is changing, and just like you were saying, that it, we, we live a life now when we expect to be watched, when, which we welcome it 
in which we feel validated by the number of likes and retweets and all these kinds of things. He was saying that though in the context of monitoring communications and building, you know, apparatuses of the state to monitor communications. Now he wasn't calling for a wholesale throw out privacy laws and, and rules and this kind of thing, but it gave you a really sen a sense, and for me a really kind of you know, astonishing little glimpse into the fact that this whole generation of people who grew up with privacy thinking it means one thing, and as being this legally enforced bright line that you don't cross, totally understood that that definition is changing, and that the law was not keeping up with it, but that cultural practices and norms and mores were all changing. Uh, and for me, it was a little bit of a, of a thing to, to, to worry about if, you know, the number two spy in America is sort of saying, you know, hey, privacy isn't what it used to be, kids. Um, but, but he's right. It's not. And I think oftentimes we don't have in national security circles and in criminal and law enforcement circles, we don't even have a common agreed upon vocabulary of what privacy means. And the law is, you know, is tremendously outdated uh, in some respects. Uh, and I think that we haven't even, you know, it won't come as any surprise to people in this room that Washington is not big on taking on big ideas and challenging topics right now. But, you know, this is one that, that, that policymakers are going to have to grapple with because it is literally, these definitions are just, they're, they're fungible and they're changing and the law is not really addressing that. Did you want yeah, to add anything? So, so something that struck me from, from Miriam's comments was how you talked about um, expectations of privacy are changing and um, the interesting um, generational perspectives on privacy. Um, I know that everyone up here on the stage remembers what a suitcase lock looks like. When you would go on a trip, you'd get a little suitcase lock and you'd put it on your luggage and then you wouldn't see your luggage again until you got to your destination. And most of the time, when your luggage came back there, it was still locked, so you knew that nobody had gone through it. It's very different today. You go to the airport, and you just expect, I, I don't even lock my luggage anymore because they're gonna just cut it. And I used to find these notes from TSA or the predecessor that says, oh, by the way, we looked inside your luggage. And I always thought, how thoughtful of them. <laughs> That was very nice, I'm glad. You buy the lock and it says TSA ready on the package, right? Right, exactly, so they can get right into it. But I mean, now I just expect they're going to look at my skivvies, you know? Or when we pack our, our, our DOP kits, right? You, you, you take your, your, your lotions of your most, personable, your, your most personal lotions and you, you put them in a special clear bag so they could look at them and they could examine them and they could take a swab of your palm to make sure you hadn't been exposed to chemicals. And, I mean, my perspiration had never been examined before <laughs> or anything that I keep in my toiletry kit. Those are my most personal things when I travel and, you know, maybe I don't even show my wife some of those things, right? I mean, it's just very personal, but I go through the electronic detectors and everything is examined. And we just have agreed to that as a society. And if we're not really vigilant we're going to be giving up rights without even noticing that we're giving up. That we up. haven't agreed to. So uh, some of you know the story of Tyler Clemente. He was the Rutgers University freshman who a couple years ago um, committed suicide. He jumped off the George Washington Bridge. Why? Well, it was just the day after his roommate had set up a webcam in his dorm room and had taken live images of him uh, having sex or having intimacy, I should say, with another man. And this was broadcast. I mean, it was just webcast. So uh, a young person, 18 or 19 years old, found that another young person, 18 or 19 years old, uh, didn't understand what privacy meant to them. When I think about the Tyler Clemente case and the reaction that the public had to it and the reaction that college-age students had to it, um, there were a few who said, you know, well, you know, he did it, didn't he? So what's the big deal? But there were, I think, more who said, outrageous, that in your own dorm room, you would not be able to have uh, uh, intimacy, kiss somebody, without it being uh, you know, on the internet. Uh, I think young people still care about privacy. I think they care about privacy maybe in a slightly different way than we did 50 years ago. But I see very little sign that, that young people don't care at all. But I do think that there are different sort of um, Attitudes. So there's a case, and I'll be brief here, there's a case involving a nursing student who um, was uh, dissecting placentas in her nursing school class. 
and she asked, she and her, and her fellow students asked their teacher, uh, can we uh, take a picture of our placentas? Uh, now, these placentas belonged to a woman who had recently had a baby, right? But, but the students wanted to take a picture of, their, of themselves and their placentas. And the teacher said, why? And they said, I want to post it on Facebook. And the professor said, oh, you girls like that, right? But they actually did it. They posted themselves with their placentas on Facebook. Now, um, you can't tell whose placenta it was. But the sensibility there, or the lack of sensibility there that, you know, suppose you're a woman who recently had a baby at Boston Women's Hospital and a baby died. And then you're on the web and you see that somebody's holding up a fresh placenta, right? A nursing student. Wouldn't that make you feel kind of rotten? So, so what is it about people's desire to be on display that goes wrong, that takes them into, I think, a, an area, a realm of moral insensitivity. Forget the government for a second, but we don't respect one another's privacy the way we should, and I'm not sure that the whole generation of people under 25 are on board with that. So, sorry, if I may. So what I'm hearing then is there's a distinction. There, there's privacy that we voluntarily give up. Like we want to be on the internet, we want to be on Facebook with our placentas, right? And then there's the privacy. With somebody else's placenta somebody that we're else. dissecting. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I'm not, I promise I won't be on stage or on the internet with my own placenta. <laughs> okay. But then there's the privacy that, that the government is asking us to give up or demanding yes. that we give up. We don't get on the plane until we give up our privacy. Yes. Or in, in yes. New York City after 9 11, or in fact, it was after the London bombings, people would just be randomly pat down by security guards if they were just going on the subway. Just, just randomly, so you don't get on the subway. So, I mean, it's one thing you think, well, fine, you don't get on the airplane, right? But you have to commute, you have to go on the metro to get for, to your, your destination. So I think that there, there are certainly two sides to the privacy, that which we voluntarily invite the internet into our lives, like Tyler's roommate had done. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, the, the government intrusion, which is, I think, primarily what Justice Brandeis had written about with the Fourth Amendment. Uh, well, yeah, I would certainly agree that Brandeis would agree with that, uh, and especially something that Marion said resonated with me, thinking about Brandeis, and that he would certainly see privacy in, in part as a, a, as a good in itself, but especially as a means to an end. And I wonder if uh, some of you would care to comment on that. Well, what are the ends, what are the goods that privacy, if it's respected, allow us to enjoy? Well, I <clears throat> resonated with, with me when you talked about the, the freedom to experiment with who you want to be without having it be one, I mean, you, your, your life rehearsal, right? I mean, you know, sort of <clears throat> Quentin Crisp once said that his apartment was the, his dressing room for life, dressing room for the world. And there's something to this idea that what goes on at home uh, should be a space in which we can experiment, we can screw up, we can say things we wouldn't say outside of, <clears throat> you know, outside of the home. I write about this a little bit in my, <clears throat> in my essay, there's, a, there's these spaces that kind of get bridged, that, that, that sort of go between the world of the home and the world outside. <clears throat> so think about like every off-color off or impertinent text message you've ever sent to a friend. We've all done it, right? We've all said things and we've sent it off and thought like, God, I hope nobody ever finds that. Or geez, I really hope I don't get hacked. Like, I have a friend of mine in particular who we joke all the time, where like if people knew who we really were, like we'd both be out of a job. Uh, but but it's, the, it's the ability to really sort of just, you know, to play and to fool around that if you start to lose that and we're just sort of constantly on guard and worrying about what people are going to think about what we're saying, you know, I worry we could, be, and if it could, we could become like, you know, politicians in that, in that realm, right? Where every statement, I guess unless you're Donald Trump and you just say whatever you think, but, <clears throat> or Bernie Sanders for that matter, who I think is very unscripted, but like where everything feels calculated and, and sort of designed to, to guard and to ward off real interactions. Uh, I know that's, some, that's a place where I think, you know, if privacy is a good and necessary thing that sometimes maybe we should, you know, give ourselves more of and sort of fight to create those places. And, and in that respect too, I mean, I would ask, how many people have one of these in their pocket, which is an iPhone 6, right? Well, whether you know it or not, you've just made a very profound investment in your personal privacy because this is a device that is deliberately designed <laughs> to obfuscate intrusion by government authorities and hackers and lots of other people. So these, these, these options are being created. I think it's interesting that they're being created by corporations and not by governments. But I think that they, you know, whether you know it or not, you are sort of, you know, in a way, voting for more of privacy when you go out and buy a product like this than if you bought something that was more permeable, let's say.
Brandeis was very um, high toned in his explanation of why privacy is important and what the end of privacy is. He talked about uh, protection for uh, humankind's spiritual nature and their inviolate, our inviolate personalities. We don't even talk that way anymore, right? Mm -hmm. But there's something to this notion that personality uh, should be, ought to be, uh, pretty close to inviolate to allow for creativity, intellectual exploration, uh, and so forth. Um, and as far as our spiritual natures goes, you don't have to believe in a higher power to believe that human beings have a spiritual nature uh, and that that spiritual nature must be fed by time alone, time in the garden, time in the, with the books, time with the thoughts. So I think that Brandeis had a timeless vision, actually, of the value of privacy. And it bothers me sometimes that old and young alike, we are just giving it away or it's being taken from us. And both, to me, are equally terrible, the giving it away and the having it taken. Could I ask a, a question um, that I think is stickier now than it was during Brandeis' time, and that has to do with national security. So I went down the list of all the ends of privacy, then I did my little test with all the different cases that you came up with, and I said, privacy wins, privacy wins, privacy wins, privacy wins. And then all of a sudden there was national security, and I said, geez, like, how do you deal with the values protected by privacy when you also have this very significant value of national security? So I'm wondering here, is there any way, do you think, of talking about those two together? Uh, is there an overarching principle according to which we can organize <laughs> privacy versus national security? Is there any way of saying that national security can trump privacy under these particular conditions? How do you, how do you get your head around that problem? No, I think the, the answer is I mean, yes, and I think this is sort of what lawyers, particularly in the intelligence community, are grappling with you know, every day. The, the trouble is, is that most of their deliberations on this are opaque to all of us. So <clears throat> it'll, it'll come as a great surprise, and it's actually one of the, I think, understated uh, contributions of Edward Snowden's leaks about the NSA, is that it turns out that the National Security Agency, which is this gigantic global apparatus capable of gathering up you know, untold numbers of communications, is actually a highly regulated internally enterprise with a massive compliance division and all kinds of regulations about when you can and when you can't gather data and what data you can gather and what you can't and by what means and through what mechanisms. None of which is to say that those lines are appropriately drawn. That's a decision for lawmakers to make. That's, that's a policy judgment. But in terms of lines being drawn and procedures that have to be followed, it turns out there's a whole you know, thick set of them. And they are all sort of designed around just this very question of how do you balance privacy with how do you balance security. But even that kind of binary notion, I think, doesn't get fleshed out enough in the intelligence community. And it is, it is I think, a, a, a simple fact that the intelligence community would like to have more authorities, not fewer, would like to be able to get more information, not less, generally speaking. And that a lot of this is really left to lawmakers to decide. And, and, and as you know, an observer of our current Congress, that's deeply alarming to me. And speaking of uh, other values that we often find a conflict with privacy, which is the second part of your uh, answer to the panelists, the thing that comes to mind right away is the First Amendment and uh, freedom of speech. And Brandeis, certainly in the privacy article, was endlessly worried about this idea of gossip, too much gossip, of crowding out anything that was genuinely newsworthy and that people really ought to be thinking about, something that would debase public discourse. And I, I wonder if through the years, uh, he, some, some of what he foretold has, has come true in part, in that the, what has expanded is our definition of what is newsworthy, in it, uh, newsworthy uh, to include uh, almost anything that has anything to do with anybody in the public eye, even people who aren't in the public eye even if there's something newsworthy about them being where they happen to be at, at any given point. And I wonder if uh, that, that countervailing value, the First Amendment, freedom of speech, newsworthiness, uh, I wonder if uh, there's a sense in which we've gone too far in that, and if that's true, if there's any way to put the horse back in the barn, uh, or whether we simply have to make do with what we have. Uh, I, um, I think that the, uh, that the, the First Amendment you know, in, my, in my examples, in my paper, I focus on the First Amendment as the protector of art. One could focus on the First Amendment as protector of journalists or just of ordinary people speaking freely in the corporate sector. Um, but I, I, I do think that um, 
there have to be boundaries, even on the media. Uh, and even when it comes to celebrities and, and public figures, I'm, maybe I'm the only few people <laughs> in the room who believes that, uh, yeah, even celebrities have rights to privacy, that even celebrities should be able to say, yes, I posed naked for the cover of Vanity Fair, but I don't want a reporter in my backyard taking pictures of me nude sun sunbathing. That we, that we, we and this is the question, like where, if, if not at home, where, right? Uh, why can't people have some boundaries? Why can't people draw some lines? Why is it that having once spoken or once displayed, now you're deemed public property to be used mm -hmm. for whatever purposes others have? So yeah. if I could just piggyback on that real quick, because we have last week a case that goes exactly to this. Yeah. Uh, a judge in New York, I believe it was, um, fined the news website Gawker $115 million for airing a tape of Hulk Hogan having sex, the wrestler having sex with his best friend's wife. Uh, and the, the argument from Gawker was Hulk Hogan is not only a public figure, but bragged about his sexual prowess, and therefore that makes him a target, a, a doubly a target. Uh, and the judge said, no, it absolutely does not. Even you know, a professional wrestler who is sort of you know, the symbol of public spectacle, like the embodiment of it, he's actually playing this role that is this person who craves media attention and craves the spotlight. Even he has uh, privacy rights. Uh, as well, and I know for people in my industry, you know, this is this is a scary decision. Not because we necessarily supported the Hulk Hogan sex tape, but you know that the that the ramifications of this, the implications of this, are are profound. Does this mean that you know they, they, they no longer can you write about someone or even criticize them under the grounds of well they're a public figure and they don't enjoy the same privacy protections? And I know one of the first things I was taught as a journalist who writes mostly about government officials is that you can write very critical things about government officials because they're public officials and the rules are different. Uh, it sort of frees you up to not be, you know, uh, uh, <clears throat> to pull punches in a way and, and to investigate them more deeply. Um, but that's, that's a, you know, a case that we're dealing with right now. It's right there. Mm -hmm. So yeah. if, if I may, as, as a public servant sure. working for the U.S. government, um, I, I have a reaction to what you just said. I, I think you could write about public officials but public officials are acting in their public capacity. In their public capacity. capacity, yes. So what I do privately on the weekends in my home is my business versus what I do Monday through Friday in the office. Well, unless and you're running for office, then it's, well, is it everything? And everything mm -hmm. goes to your judgment, right? If you're, if you're right? So, so that becomes an excuse for anybody to write about anything. Yeah, and this is, and this is I mean, this, didn't this come up to in the, I mean, this was the Lewinsky scandal, right? I mm -hmm. mean, you know, to what extent is the, even a president's private life is private business. Well, does it bear on his judgment? Well, maybe. Is it a workplace issue because she was an intern? Well, arguably. Is this something you should deal with his wife? You know, undoubtedly. You know, where do we kind of draw those lines? And, you know, we're making those answers up, just FYI, as we mm -hmm. go. You know, mm -hmm. we're, we're executing editorial judgment uh, when we do that. And, 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 you know, in the sort of the evolution of internet media, of which my company is, you know, a, a leader, um, has, you know, greatly stretched those boundaries of what is permissible uh, and, and, and to your point too, I think it's made a lot of, you know, public officials who ordinarily wouldn't seek or be in the limelight mm -hmm. suddenly have more like targeted because because well they're public officials so we sort of lump them all together. Right. There's so also the Anthony Weiner texting yeah. of his shirtless body. Right. Right. And mm -hmm. He, by the way, is my case in point for why ethically it matters that you give up your privacy. So, what do we think about Congressman Weiner, a member of Congress who? Uh, tweeted images of himself and his tidy whities to unknown women across the country. We think he's not a good person. We think he lacks character, he lacks virtue, he lacks uh, modesty, he lacks dis discretion, he lacks judgment. We judge him badly because he gave up his privacy. And I think there's nothing um, wrong about saying that although it was voluntary, it was unethical. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I find that fascinating that idea and I think Brandeis would agree that there's an ethical obligation to maintain one's own privacy. If you'd like to amplify on that a little bit, uh, I think we might like to hear because that, that to me is a very challenging provocative point of view. Well, you know, I think that, that one way of understanding privacy, probably the dominant way in the last 25 years, has been to see privacy as an option. It's like chocolate or vanilla, you know. You take your choice, privacy or not privacy, chocolate or vanilla, or Lamborghini or Porsche, you know, whatever. It, they're, they're personal choices you make, and there's nothing at all at stake if you choose to give it up. But when I look at cases like Anthony Weiner, I think, no, it's, it's not like that at all. 
because there's a certain, there's certain baseline of privacy, which if you give up, you've given up aspects of your freedom and your dignity, and it morally matters. And I think that we have to be careful uh, that we don't let the, um, the, I call it the libertarian conception of privacy, it's just a choice, uh, overshadow the kind of more Aristotelian, as it were, dimensions and the more Kantian dimensions of privacy, of which I think there are many. And so I've been trying in my, my work to give voice to these more Aristotelian and Kantian understandings of privacy, even though I'm kind of a libertarian, you know, that I, 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 I'm afraid we're only, some of us are only seeing one side of this, so we, we've given up on privacy because we don't think anything is morally at stake, but I think something morally is at stake. Duty to ensure. But, Exactly, I put it that way sometimes, so, yes. So it's interesting, um, Dan, that there may be two really different kinds of cases. Cases where you have a choice to give up your privacy, and I happen to agree totally with you as um, someone who takes dignity as the first norm. But there's so many other kinds of cases where you don't have a choice. And your, person, your personal responsibility in those cases is to give up technology mm -hmm. in order to preserve privacy. So I know many people who don't, I don't have a cell phone, right? <laughs> because I don't, I don't want. You, you really don't have a cell phone? I don't have a cell phone. Oh, wow. So. We need to study you. <laughs> <laughs> so my husband doesn't either, there's two of us. So, but so that's, that's giving something up, presumably, really big. Yes. In order to preserve privacy, it's taking responsibility, but it's also a loss. And, and why I bring up that example is there may be something akin to blaming victims when we say, well, you didn't have to go on Facebook or you didn't have to get a cell phone or you didn't, I don't know what all these apps are since I don't have a cell phone, but apps to shop, you didn't have to get those. In a way, it is sort of blaming the victim, which is the opposite side of not taking personal responsibility. And those are cases, I think, in which most normal human beings don't have a choice. Most normal human beings need a cell phone. Complex shaming. Yeah, I, I feel increasingly vulnerable too because you know I can't protect myself from big data, right? I mean, not really, right? Um, if you go to the doctor, if you ever shop with a credit card or a debit card, you know, it's gone. Um, so, so is there what what use is there to saying that I have an obligation to protect my own privacy in a world in which I can't protect my own privacy absolutely, and there are many many forces which are bigger than me, which which I can't control, right? Yeah. So I'd like to find a kind of a, a balance here between there are things I can't control. I can't control the use of big data by my hospital system, right? But I can control how often I go onto Facebook or how often I tweet or how often I uh, shop with, um, with my American Express card or um, how often I'm in standing in front of my window naked. I mean, I can control some things. I can't control. So the things that we can control that do have some relationship to significant and meaningful forms of dignity and character and um, the sanctity of, you know, we should attempt to keep those things um, private. So I see really why it's so important for you to move back to or forward to the trope of home. Yeah. Because it seems to me that that's the only place that you might have any control left. So it's. You might have. You might have. Putting aside the wife beaters and the, you know, the, the, yeah. the partner violence and the gender so oppression and the so, <laughs> so I, I welfare infect inspectors and. So this is a question for people who do the history of the future. Yeah. Um, can you foresee any time at which we turn back the clock so that in fact there's more privacy because there's less data collection? Or is uh, history just moving forward in the direction of less and less privacy? I mean, because so it seems like this motor force in a way, but presumably there are checks. Can you imagine turning back or not? Well, we could look to the European example. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing that strikes people now is that it might not be such a bad thing to do what the Europeans have begun to do and adopt some kind of right of forgetting. Wouldn't it be good against the state, but it would be good against Google. So that if you felt that, F that Google searches would reveal things about you and other websites that were irrelevant, uh, out of date, maybe depending how things develop scandalous, you could uh, go to Google and, and have them uh, take that out of their search engine so it wouldn't appear in a Google search. That's one thing that might be done. Uh, Brandeis himself, of course, based some of his privacy article on English models and, and French models. So it might not be such a bad thing to learn from the European model, but, but then again, we have a freedom of speech, freedom of information concerns there that uh, may make it inappropriate here. Mm -hmm. 
that would I'll go back <clears throat> and say like the, the, there's I feel like in, in, in law that the answer is probably no. I mean, there's a few post 9-11 laws in the national security space that have reined in the National Security Agency, for instance, arguably have not done that much and in some cases have actually expanded things and made them legal when they used to be illegal. But I keep coming back to this idea of you know, things like the iPhone 6 and the adoption of encryption and the degree to which companies like Google now and like, and, and like Apple are using end-to-end -end encryption to essentially say we are going to give our users, our customers, the power to completely make private their communications. Uh, I mean, and not completely. I mean, somebody could take a screenshot of something that you texted. But essentially, you know, keeping it out of government hands, out of hackers' hands, out of people who aren't authorized to have it, to the extent that even Apple, with the new iPhone 6, if the FBI goes to it and says, we want you to help us unlock the phone, Apple would say, we can't. We literally don't know how to do it because the keys to do that reside with the user. That's a very powerful trend. And I think what this, this, this fight over between the FBI and Apple right now over encryption, really, it, it, it's kind of a tip of the iceberg where there's a real philosophical kind of debate going on right now over whether or not people should have the power to affirmatively encrypt and protect their communications uh, and keep it out of the hands even of government agents with a warrant. That's a, that's a massive, massive societal shift that that ha if that happens. It terrifies the FBI. Um, it's going to become a debate in Congress, but you know, it seems to me that there you go. There's maybe a kind of, you know, a bit of a rolling back the, this progress, or at least using the technology itself to enhance people's personal privacy mm -hmm. if they want to do it. Well, we could talk for a long time about these topics, but I think the time has come to turn things over to the audience. Uh, if anybody has any questions, we have a microphone over there and a microphone over there. So if uh, possible, uh, perhaps we could have uh, groups of students come up first and ask whatever questions have appeal to them, uh, maybe in groups of three. We have uh, one brave student who is now making his way to the microphone. And if you would, uh, just introduce yourself, uh, and then you could ask your question to one or all of the panelists. Thank you all for coming. Um, my name is Josh, I'm a senior here at Brandeis. And kind of what we were just talking about a second ago, I've been th trying to think about what Brandeis would have thought of the debate between Apple and the FBI right now, and kind of where he would have ended up on this. And so if any of you have a thought on looking through Brandeis on privacy to prepare for this panel, where he would have come down on this issue. I'll say that I think that he would have been, and now we get into the dangerous territory of imagining <laughs> what he would have thought, right? But my read suggests that he would have thought that the that encryption per se, big thumbs up, right? I mean, if it empowers people to be able to keep, you know, these meddlesome forces like myself, journalists and pesky people, and out of your out of your private life, and gives you some sort of affirmative ability to protect your privacy and to even extend it into places where you know it might not have existed before, like if Google is encrypting your email data at rest, right? Your emails are in Google servers, but don't worry, they're encrypted there too. That he would have thought that that was generally a good. But I think he also would have been really troubled by the idea that the law does not currently carve out any exception for that. Um, that the law doesn't address what obligations companies like Google and Facebook and Apple have to actually build their systems in such a way that they can provide information to the government if it comes seeking the information with the warrant. So, and, and I, so I, I would imagine he would, I mean, I, there I'll stop and just say he would have had a lot to say about it. I don't know what he would have said, but I think he would see the kind of the inherent tension that we're all dealing with right now. So I'll, I'll take a stab at answering as well. So I, I tend to think that Brandeis would, would rule in favor of Apple on this. So if you think about the actual words of the Fourth Amendment, it uh, protects the persons, houses, papers, and effects. So certainly you could see that the phone would be the effect of the person, but also maybe the papers, right? We, we don't have papers. We don't write letters anymore, right? We text or we email. How? And we email through our phones. So that's just, it's just essentially it's the stationary. It's like Brandeis talked about being able to go through the papers without having to reach into the drawers to get them. I personally think that he would um, find in favor of Apple on this. So, you know, I, I hate to be the bummer here, but so um, 
you know, I wish it was that Apple cared about privacy for real, right? Because, you know, look at this thing, you know, it comes loaded with, with encouragement for me to use iCloud, to use Twitter, to use Instagram, to use mm -hmm. Facebook. Um, I have to set all kinds of complicated settings to keep the advertisers, uh, you know, away from me, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This, buying this device is like saying, I want to be in constant communication with the corporate sector, right? So, um, and, so there's one thing. The other thing is that, of course, um, the government can already, uh, while you're making a telephone call on your iPhone or your other cell phone, they can intercept the call. It's, you know, it's not hard to do. There's plenty of access already to your, your, your telephonic communication uh, that's, that's completely legal with a court order. Mm -hmm. um, there is a statute that does, that does relate somewhat to this called CALEA. It's a statute which has been on the books now for a couple of decades, but it, it's basically a law which says that telecommunications uh, device creators cannot create a method of communication to which there's not a backdoor for government because law enforcement needs that. We have long ago um, uh, ceded to the government the right to access our communications. When Skype was first invented, it seemed to be an exception to this uh, uh, CALEA statute. Within a few months, Congress had passed a law that incorporated voice over internet protocol into the same category as an ordinary landline phone or a telephone. So I'm a little bit puzzled a little, you know, by all this claim. It's not Apple is a champion of privacy. And if Apple wins, then we all win. Because I think that Apple is a company with a commercial agenda, and the government already has plenty of access to our communications. Okay. People uh, go there first, and then over there. So start with you. Um, so my question's kind of about the media and uh, privacy and how uh, I think Brandeis' right to privacy article was largely based on uh, the media and sort of a fear of the media um, being more invasive. And I wonder if we're seeing that with the rise of uh, things like data journalism uh, and more and more uh, the confluence of, you know, where media companies and technology companies are moving closer together with, you know, companies like Google almost, almost being both a technology company and a media company. Um, do you think that um, do you think that that concern is uh, the, the right to privacy from the government is I mean it's uh, it's probably stronger but um, you know it's sort of in that same vein as is there a right to privacy from each other as well as from the government is there a right to privacy of the media and where the, where does that fall in that hierarchy? Yeah, I mean, I, this is where, I mean, to go back to the Hulk Hogan case, right? I mean, you know, you, and there have been other cases of celebrities and public figures and what rights of protection that they have. I mean, going back many years, whenever a new technology is invented, it seems like we start kind of, you know, testing it. <clears throat> um, uh, 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 but, you know, I, I think that, he, you know, again, we're Brandeis alive today. I think he'd be really troubled by a lot of what passes for journalism right now. And not even so much journalism that is, is necessarily invading people's private lives, although like things like TMZ and to some extent Gawker and other celebrity kind of places that almost fetishize celebrity uh, and go out seeking ways to get into people's private lives certainly fall in that category. But the extent to which there is so much sort of blood curdling, you know, screaming journalism that goes on that's clickbait. Right, that is not necessarily there to illuminate ideas and to inform people, but to get them to click on something so that we can count it as a statistic. And look, I'm not exempting you know, my own company from this either. I mean, journalists today, and you see this at the New York Times, the Washington Post, lots of venerable old media establishments constantly grappling with the how do we bring people and read the article? How do we get them and pull them in? And this creates some, you know, to some, Sometimes I think this tendency to sensationalize or to overstate or to overamplify or to give in to hyperbole. And, 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 you know, and then you know, if you are looking for more of those kinds of stories, does then that change your reporting and then lead you down the road of perhaps looking in places for stories that aren't really stories, but you'll print them because they're titillating. That, that's, that's a real problem, yeah. And I think that if he were, you know, he would probably be seeing a lot of the sort of the symptoms that were wrong, you know, that, that uh, of, of kind of yellow journalism, as it would have been called back then, um, coming to the fore today in internet journalism. Yes, please. Um, so about like how, uh, about the thing about how, how um, the, the desire for privacy might be lessened, uh, it, it might be lessened now as compared to as compared to before. Um, 
it feels kind of. It, 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 I'm worried about talking uh, uh, about discussing that without without talking about how like often ways that um, that that data is collected are deliberately obscured and deliberately like not talked about because like big data is a, is a corporate thing and they have a vested interest in making us not think about how like. If you type something into the status, into the update your status on Facebook and then delete it, it's still sent off to Facebook servers. Um, and like, I'm, uh, 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 there are people who are. Uh, 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 yes, we are. There's a lot of technical consenting to this stuff, but I, I, I'm worried about how much uh, about like the assumption that this is all sufficiently informed consent. Mm -hmm. you, um, yeah. You've hit upon one of the top issues in the privacy um, world today, which is transparency. And a lot of people believe that uh, one of the things which has to happen, if we're not going to continue in this current funk, is that, is that what we do that in fact puts our privacy, our data at risk, needs to be obvious to us, made o open to us. And I think that that would be an improvement. A way to not continue to go in the wrong direction would be to increase the um, transparency of our uses of our data and, our, and our, uh, other people's uses of our data as well. So I, I, I think you hit upon a great question, a great point. That is, well, I went to that too, and to go to your point about, the, um, about Apple having a, a corporate interest in this. Yeah. Absolutely, right? And to a great extent, I mean, here I am talking about this as an information preservation tool. This is an information dissemination tool, right? Most of what this is is, is about leaking your data, not, not, not keeping it for yourself. And it's leaking it to all of the third-party providers that essentially rent space on your phone from Apple. Uh, so let's, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right and to, the, to your point as well. If we're going to have a really informed debate about privacy, we've been talking a lot for the past 15 years about what the government is authorized to do with your data. We've had very little conversation about what corporations are doing with your data and the comparably few laws and regulations that restrict them. Um, hi, thank you so much uh, for the panel. My name is Alex. I'm a uh, uh, senior at Brandes here. Um, uh, my question, I, I just want to go back to the uh, Apple FBI issue a little bit. Um, I share Perez Allen's concern that we're, it seems that we're trusting Apple, a corporate. Uh, we're trusting, we're counting on its morality of this problem, this issue, right? Um, they are not leaking our data or they create this uh, you know, mechanism that our data would not be released to the government. But if I understand the issue correctly, uh, what's really stopping the government from getting the data is we're not, we don't have a fast computer enough. Uh, it's, uh, you know, someday we're going to have a, uh, you know, more powerful computer that's going to, you know, uh, decipher all of these mechanisms that, you know, companies like, like Apple design. So what I'm trying to ask is, uh, do you expect there's going to be a you know, new norm in American politics that there is a check and balance between big technological firms and the government? You know, because the government is held accountable by the people, but the technological firms are not. They are checked by the government you know, you know, to, to a lot of sense. So I'm just, I, like, I have this giant uh, idea of what we're, we're, what are we expecting in the future when you know the technological advances so much that you know the government could actually have this penetration to the technological firm or you know whether the te technological firms they're going to actually keep themselves uh, in a position that uh, you, you know they're going to have this war this conflict with the government you know what what is this going to play out do you have a say a prediction you know it's an interesting thought uh, I, thank you. Um, I, I'm not particularly optimistic about where this goes. <clears throat> um, I think that eventually Congress is going to weigh in, you know, in the, in the present Apple FBI debate, Congress is going to have to weigh in at, to, at some point. Now, whether they amend CALEA to explicitly include companies like Apple, which are not explicitly included, in fact, some would argue they're explicitly excluded uh, from the law, maybe they can do it that way. But I don't think there's a lot of turning back this trend, at least as far as Apple's concerned, of them really, you know, affirmatively and consciously implementing technology that is designed to make it harder for government to affect warrants. Uh, I think that's a conscious choice that they're making. And until Congress stops them from doing it, that they're probably going to do it. And in their mind, they are doing that 
for the benefit of their, and the security of their customers. And, and also they feel like they have an affirmative obligation to do that. Now critics would say you're just trying to protect your brand. But I, I see this as a really, if we're sort of like stepping back to the, you know, the 50,000 foot level, I really think that in this technological space there is a big struggle for power over shaping that space and access to it between corporate interest and the government. And I think that, that the private sector is positioned to protect itself here and to start actually making policy de facto by the decisions that it, that it reaches. I mean, if, if Apple just decides the iPhone 6 is going to be impenetrable to, to government agencies, no matter how big the computer is, because we're gonna build in mechanisms that if you try and brute force the phone, it's gonna self-destruct. That's a policy, <laughs> and nobody voted on that, right? Apple decided to do that. And it affects all of us, and it has benefits, but it also creates real obstacles uh, for government and for law enforcement. Uh, you know, I see the debate really playing out it, this way and not so much in big, grand debates in Congress. I think Congress is very likely to take sort of small bites at the apple, if we're pardon the pun. You know, I, I um, am a member of something called the um, Forum on Cyber Resilience which is a forum of the National Academies of Science. And I spend a lot of time in rooms with brilliant cryptographers and scientists and engineers. And I must tell you that I don't think they could answer these questions that are being asked today. Mm -hmm. There's widespread disagreement about what Apple can't do, what Apple can do, what the government can do, what the government can't do, uh, how long it would take, how expensive it would be. So I find my, my own, my, my, I'm just like in a dizzying whirlwind of you know, uncertainty right here. I, I wish I had answers. But, um, but I do think that, it, that, that what is true is that there's a little bit of a power struggle here. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's not the, the white hats versus the black hats kind of a power struggle. I think it's like the gray hats and the gray hats, you know, and, and somebody's going to eventually win. And the courts will probably have a big role to say in, in what happens down the line. And perhaps we'll uh, turn to a slightly older person. You've been standing there a while. So why don't you go right ahead. Hi, Jordan Pollack, Computer Science. I was struck by some of Anita's discussion of the invasiveness of photography, and I've often thought that copyright law got photography backwards, and that the person who is taking the picture owns the picture, instead of the person who, don't do that, <laughs> has their picture taken owning the picture. And I think if we, if we trace that copyright decision uh, forward from where it started in the past, and we get to the paparazzis, and we get to the uh, peeping toms with the Aaron Andrews case, and we get to uh, the wrestler and his case. And these are all situations where the person who takes the video claims ownership of the video, even though the person, the subject, has no rights. And I think that as we look at the evolution of copyright law, uh, that might be something that impinges on privacy in a larger way than we might have originally thought. Yeah, and in my paper I do cite an example of a video artist who uh, also looks in people's windows and takes, but takes a video, and uh, some of his artwork shows, you know, naked women getting out of the shower in their apartments, and he was, and, uh, and you're right, the, 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 the women being photographed, they have no legal claim on their image. The person who makes the video, it's his property. And he gets to put it on display in a museum or in an installation or whatever he wants to do with it. And it's, it seems fundamentally misguided to think that um, inviolent personality doesn't include some say so over what other people do with recognizable images of us. We, um, there was a case at MIT Media Lab yeah. where uh, Nicholas Negroponte put his standard photo up on the back of a book and was sued by the photographer for misuse of the photographer's property. Yeah, uh, and if I could just make one point about, about this, I want everyone to be clear about what rights we do have regarding photographs. If, if someone takes your picture and uses your picture in an advertisement to sell their stuff, you know, you're walking down the street, you're wearing a pair of cute jeans, the Gap takes a picture of you and uses you to advertise their, their product, you can recover in a privacy action for that, because it's a commercial appropriation of your name or your likeness or your identity. But if someone does it for the sake of art or so, news, you're out of luck, because so, art and news are protected by the First right. Amendment. So if the NSA opens a new department <laughs> of national art, 
and basically starts taking the video of all citizens in, in their everyday The courts activity. would see right through that, especially Brandon. Yes. You think so? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. As an actual question on this, so, but, and this is, it'll sound facetious, but I'm trying to get at something serious, but, so if a hacker takes over someone's webcam, and films that person moving around in their, you know, apartment, going, you know, getting in and out of the shower, this kind of thing. You can prosecute them, obviously, for hacking their computer. But would that hacker have the ability then to still take the video and use it as an art project? Even though he, so he's claiming, I did this for art, and yes, I, I committed a crime, and I'll, I'll be punished for the crime, but the product is still This something is the question about keep. context that you gave before, right? We have to have a, the courts would have a debate and discussion. Is this a highly offensive, invasion of privacy? Does this violate somebody's expectations of privacy? Mm -hmm. Or is it something else? Mm -hmm. and, if it, and if the court finds that it's truly art, in the cases that I described in my paper, the courts emphasize that, that these are real artists. They're people whose artwork is shown in galleries. Critics right. write about their photographs and their videos. Therefore, it's real art. The hacker couldn't say that they've been reviewed in the New York Times mm -hmm. or on the Daily Beast yeah. or right. you know, in the Washington Post or in mm -hmm. Art Forum magazine. So they would lose. But the, the real artist is really protected. What if it's an artist who also becomes a hacker? Mm -hmm. But is the hacking a work of art? It could right. be. It could be a performance right. of art, right? right? right. Which, which is why we yeah. kind of go into this absurd, you know, yeah. this absurd path where ultimately we have no privacy rights left yeah. because everybody can claim to be, you know. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. yeah. Well, uh, hi. Thank you all for coming. Oh, uh, my name is Eric. I'm a sophomore. Um, I want to bring back to what you were saying about transparency earlier. Um, and you know, you know, we have these like terms of conditions that you know we all check yes on because we're just very eager to use the product or the service. Um, but you know, we all use email, and you know, it's it's hard to be a, a working member of society in 2016 without using email. Mm -hmm. So we all, we, you know, we have the transparency of what you know Gmail can do with all our information, but we check yes on it, and that's could be considered transparency, I guess. But is there any further you know steps for limiting? what they do with it, or are we just so far gone that, you know, we have to submit to what they, whatever they want to do with it because there's no other choice. Like, if you're talking, we, we talked earlier about um, in London how, you know, you can get pat down before you get into the subway. If you don't want to get pat down, you don't have to take the subway, you can take a cab, but what other options do we have with email? Um, everyone has to use it, and mm -hmm. do we just have to submit to it at this point? I think that there's potentially market forces that could come into play here. Um, <clears throat> there may be, you know, if the encryption debate continues in the direction that it's going, and all signs are that it's going to keep being a bigger and higher profile debate as the FBI and the Apple and Apple kind of go through the procedures here in court. Um, maybe there will be companies that advertise themselves as saying, look, we are radically transparent in what we do with your data, which is mm -hmm. we do nothing with it. Mm -hmm. um, there was a company called LavaBit um, that was sort of a, an email provider that offered kind of Perfect encryption because they didn't have the keys to decrypt uh, the information, and it turned and, and so basically you could use this email with the perfect sort of uh, uh, no, the knowledge that there was no way that even if someone intercepted the message that LavaBit could ever help them or help the government decrypt it, um, and, it and it was a you know a popular service among some people. Um, the, the, the the downside of that was it was also an email service that Edward Snowden used, and then the government went to them and said, "We demand all of the keys for all of your customers, so we can basically try and, you know, guess what his tech, what his, what his, uh, decrypt his email." And the company shut down; it went out of business rather than comply with that. So there's some disincentive for companies to offer that kind of service. But I think it's a potentially um, some companies will start advertising this and, and being just much more transparent about it. They're going to have to be small companies, though, because like a company like Google is never going to come out and say, you know what, forget about it. We're no longer selling your data adver to advertisers, because then Google would cease to exist. It's an advertising company that happens to offer email. Mm -hmm. And now it's your honor to present the last question. Um, yes. Oh. <laughs> we can make them quick. Um, make them quick. I would like to go back to the questions about context. For example, when you say earlier about whether a person hacking is an art or not. Um, I would like to ask, does that mean that whether the judge is going to decide if it's an intrusion of privacy is based on the damage of what the action was caused? For example, if a hacker hacks your computer and he posts an email of you just walking around fully closed, and, or it could be a video that you were just taking out showers, you're naked, 
And when you see that your video was posted online, does that mean that the amount of recovery you will get depends on the damage you got rather than the act of intrusion itself from the hacker. And if that's true, then I really don't think that that's fair because the action is wrong no matter how much the damage was caused. So could you give me some uh, insight in this, please? Thank you. Sure. I mean, just, uh, just a, a, I mean, a, a traditional tort case in the law is that you restore the victim to where they were before the, the wrongdoing occurred. So it's not unusual that you look at the amount of damage, and then that's the amount of compensation you get. And I think in your question, you, you presume that the person walking around clothed might have less damage than the person walking around naked, although you agree that either way, it's, it's a wrongdoing. So I think what I would ask is, in either case, whether the person was clothed or not, what's the damage? I mean, there's damage to dignity, there's damage to the loss of privacy, but did they lose any money? Did they lose a job? Did they lose something that could be compensated under the law as the law exists now? when you are videotaping this action, you really don't know where this is going to go. For example, I, as the person who is being videotaped, I could be saying something extremely confidential, mm -hmm. something that's not supposed to be leaked out. So when you are hacking this computer, you really cannot know where this conversations or the scene is might going. So where should we set the line here? There are analogous issues in other parts of the law. So if you have a drunk driver, you know, you get in the car, you, you drive drunk, uh, you might hit somebody and kill them, or you might hit somebody and just break their little toe, right? Mm -hmm. So should the damages be exactly the same because the action is exactly the same? I think our legal system says, no, you take your victim as you find them. Mm -hmm. If you kill somebody, you have to pay the family, you know, a gazillion dollars. If you break their toe, you gotta pay them 200 bucks to get their toe taped up. You know, but so, so we don't just look at the, at the act performed, we look at the act performed and its wrongfulness, and then we have to say, what were the consequences? And you pay more if the consequences were right. It's true that we don't have a very good vocabulary for the consequences of privacy invasion, mm -hmm. and sometimes we think that, well, if it's just your dignity, you know, just give, you, give a little nominal damage and send them home. Mm -hmm. But this woman who, who uh, was spied on in her hotel room, Erin uh, Andrews, she got $55 million, $55 million. And Hulk Hogan got, what, 100 and? 115, I think. Yeah, yeah. So uh, fair or not, I'll let you decide. <laughs> OK, mm -hmm. thank you. And perhaps a, a very quick final question. Yeah, this is just a quicker question on kind of the jurisdiction of the US. Because to the email question, uh, there is an internet, there is another company called Proton Mail, which is based in Switzerland. Um, so all their servers and all their technologies is kept in Switzerland, and they use um, P2P encryption. So that's, my question is more focused on the jurisdiction of the U.S. to uh, do that same act with, with, uh, that they did on the other company to obtain the private keys. Um, what is the extent of the jurisdiction of the U.S. for like other international companies um, that are kind of making encryption-based um, communications more accessible to the public? Um, they, they don't have any jurisdiction. That is the short answer, and as a user of Proton Mail, that's a plus for me. Um, <laughs> I have it on my phone. Um, uh, but 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 in that case, it, it, and we we've, see, we've actually seen this from the Snowden documents. If the NSA wants to obtain that information that's in a foreign server, there's something called Executive Order 12333, uh, which allows them, as a part of their foreign intelligence em uh, mission, to go steal it. So if they really wanted something that was in a Proton Mail server we would probably dispatch the NSA to figure out how to hack into the server and how to get it um, surreptitiously. Well, it's uh, time to draw to a close. And I uh, wanted to just close by mentioning that there seems to be a school of thought, you run into this sometimes, whereby history is depicted as a series of cycles in which for 10,000 years, we were all living in villages, we had no expectation of privacy, there's no such thing as privacy. And then all of a sudden, we get into the modern industrial age, and Brandeis and Warren discover this right of privacy. It's written into the law, and it's elaborated over the next 100, 120 years. And then we now live in a time where the internet has created a brand new village, this time a global village in which we're all equal members of, so that perhaps privacy is a thing of the past again. We're just all going back to village life. 
And I think we've seen, perhaps, that there are powerful reasons to question that. There are powerful reasons to start talking and keep talking about privacy, what it's good for, and why we need it, and why, uh, in that process, Brandeis will continue to be an ally and a support. So I'd like to uh, hope you'll join me in uh, thanking our panelists and our commentator this afternoon with a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you very much.